All right. So Rails 3.1 is just around the corner, and it includes a lot of wonderful things. I am going to talk mainly about one of those wonderful things today, but uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of information about the rest. So this talk is entitled The Asset Pipeline and Postmodern Hybrid and Our Postmodern Hybrid JavaScript Future. Let's start with the first part, um, the asset pipeline, which is by far my favorite new element in Rails 3.1, and I think it's going to have a huge impact on how we all create web applications, Rails applications, going forward. But before we go into the mechanics of, of how it works, I want to focus a little bit about on the origins about how this came about. All of the things that I try to work on in Rails start out as, as problems, something that's just a, a nagging sense of some kind that, that this stuff could be, could be better, because there's a direct pain. There's something that's just um, jumping out at me when I'm looking at a, a Rails code base and thinking, this is really not good enough. We have to do, do better here. Uh, this is annoying me every time I look at it. A lot of the time, that's actually a visual pain. I'll be looking at a piece of code, and it just offends me. Like There's something here that's just, this is supposed to be simpler. This is supposed to be cleaner. Why is this a mess? So we've been going through this cycle over and over and over again with Rails, and that's how we usually release a new version. We reduce pain, we take it out, and leave it with something more pleasurable. And I think that that's really a good cycle to be in when you're trying to design a framework, is to focus on the problems, focus on the pain that you have, because then you sort of know when you're done. It's very easy to just continue on programming when you're a framework builder, and, and before you know it, you have much more than that original pain, and how did this all come to be, and, and you have too much stuff. We try really hard not to have too much stuff. The stuff that goes into a new version of Rails is because somebody was personally annoyed uh, about the old way. Now, one of the key things I've been annoyed about for a very long time is this. This is a directory in Basecamp of all the JavaScript files that we have in just one big directory called JavaScript. Now, just seeing this image when I took this um, screenshot, I was like, huh, this is fucking terrible. Like, why are all these files here? Why are they just in one big uh, lump? And then when you start to dive into it, it offends you even more, because look at this, for example. Calendar date JS, calendar date format, calendar date select. This is obviously a unit. This is a unit of work that is supposed to be grouped together, and the only way we're grouping it together is by underscores. That's a pretty poor form of, uh, of grouping. And not only that, it's at a completely different level of abstraction than, say, Fancy Zoom, which is an external library that we just dumped into the same directory, too. Like, here I have code that I wrote right next to code that somebody else wrote. That doesn't feel right. Um, it might, both elements might be sort of library code, but um, it feels like it should be separate. It gets even worse when you look at all ele elements of it. For example, milestones.js. This is JavaScript that goes with a single controller. We're mixing levels of abstraction here that have nothing to do with each other, and it's just one big cluster. Or it's a junk drawer. It's not that junk drawers are not useful. They have useful tools. There's uh, a measuring tape in there. Sometimes you need a measuring tape. But if you have to go into a junk drawer to get it, that's going to just start off the day on the wrong foot. That's not a great way of getting, getting stuff done. You want the measuring tape to be together with other things that have to do with measuring and cutting, not rubber bands or uh, uh, pencils or something else like that. What I found is that I think there's a general rule here. And the general rule is roughly if you have more than 13 things together, if you have more than that, it's not good. There's something wrong here. Just the, the sheer number 13, when I've been looking at, at files that has methods or um, directories or something, as soon as we get above that, it just instinctively feels messy. 
it gets a lot worse when you then add things at different level of abstraction, but, but even just when you have more than 13 of the same things, it feels messy. And when it feels messy, you need pushback. You need somebody to, or something, to enforce the rules. You need a cop of some kind. Um, for folders, they have this, this problem of sort of the boiling frog. Um, you slowly get boiled. No folders start out with 20 files in them. They start out with two files in them. Then you add one more, and then you have three, and then you add a few more, and then you have 15. And you sort of, how did I get here? Like, I felt that this project was nice and clean when I started out, and something happened, and all of a sudden it wasn't very clean anymore. You didn't have this pushback. So I was thinking, how can we combat that? How can we sort of enforce this, this metric? And it's like, what if um, we just had folders that could only hold 13 files? That was it. You couldn't add another file to it. It's like, yeah, that's, that's kind of arbitrary, which is, of course, how a lot of laws come to be. There's sort of just arbitrary restrictions that don't tell you anything about why it's there. So you want the rule in place to enforce that you, you, you keep developing a, a nice, clean application. But you also want the justification of why the rule is there in place. We had that with REST. REST was exactly the same problem, just applied to a different scope. It was applied to controllers. Controllers had a very easy tendency to get to 13 methods or more just because you poured junk into them. Because just adding one more method doesn't feel that bad. And before you know it, you have 13. So we put in a natural restriction of 7. Oh, 6. Can't even count. Um, so 6 methods, that's the default methods. If you have one more than that, it feels wrong because you're somehow breaking uh, the conventions we have there. So that was good. That's nice. We, we should think about ways we could apply something similar to, to the JavaScript drunk drawer problem. But at least it's better than, than what we used to have, which was just one megabit file where everything got dumped into. Um, that's more like uh, trash bag development. And I much prefer junk drawer development to trash bag development. And the reason we got there was we, we had this thing. So JavaScript include tag, include everything. Now. This made it really easy just to have all those files you saw on the first slide in, in one big directory because it would concatenate all of them and it would cache it nicely. So we made one of the problems really easy to solve. We made the problem of concatenation of speed something that's easy. The trade-off was that we also made it very easy to, to make that mesh you saw. Now, this is a powerful insight. People will do what's easy. So it's easy right now to write Style tree, include, tag, everything, right? Which means it's easy to concatenate everything, which means it's easy to dump everything into just one big folder. OK, well, that's, that's good. If, if we could somehow flip that around so that something else becomes easy, then, then we're on the right path. In any case, the conclusion to all of this is the conclusion to making it easy to turn JavaScript and style sheets and all sorts of other assets into a big junk drawer is that we treat them as second class citizens. We don't care about the CSS and the JavaScript code nearly as much as we care about the Ruby code. Because the Ruby code is nicely organized. We have sort of um, schemes for dealing with that and thus we care about that more. I think that that's not a winning strategy. I think that uh, Web applications and web developers have to sort of come out of that. We've already had this, this big blend where we used to have just front-end developers who would touch the messy HTML and JavaScript stuff, and then we had the back-end developers who focused on the nice, clean Ruby stuff. Uh, I think that's blending, and I think that that's a wonderful thing. I don't think that these should be separate roles. So what's the solution here? Um, the solution sort of takes inspiration from, I think, one of the greatest innovations of Ruby on Rails. One of the things I'm most proud about in, in, in everything we've set up with this framework, which is two things. One, empty folders. Empty folders and empty files. I think empty folders and empty files are two of the pivotal innovations in Rails that has uh, encouraged us to write clean applications since the framework 
appeared. And I think this is true because when you have a place for everything and everything is in its place, things feel nice. They feel clean and you feel calm about it. When everything is a big mess, it's sort of, you're dreading working with it. I dread working with that JavaScript folder because I know that everything is just piled in together. And I know the effects, the broken window theory of piling everything in together is that nobody gives a shit of what's in the individual files. This is all a big mess anyway, so who cares if I just add another piece of crappy JavaScript code to the end of this one file in this one big pile? Nobody cares. When everything is in its place and, and everything has a place, we do care. Like Nobody's going to be the asshole that throws trash on a clean street. Nobody's going to be the asshole that adds nasty code to a nice, pristine code base. So as long as you can keep that idea going that this is clean, that this is nicely organized, and this is good, um, people will try very hard to live up to that. So with the asset pipeline, we're introducing a set of new innovations, empty folders. There is going to be three empty folders in three different places. Uh, the asset pipeline deals with images, style sheets, and JavaScripts and makes it really clean to have all of these things in the places where they feel home. So we have app assets, lib assets, and vendor assets. If you take the example from before, milestones.js would go into app assets, because it's JavaScript that relates to the application itself, to one of the controllers. We would put in calendar date into lib assets, because it's sort of a little um, library that I wrote for my own application. It's not particular to this application, but it, it goes with this application, and I wrote it. And finally, you would put in fancy Zoom in vendor assets. Now, just doing that, just having three different places to put these three scopes of assets is a huge win. As soon as I started doing this, I went from having 40 files in one folder to having, I don't know, 15 in each folder. Not below the 13, still feels messy, much better though. So these are just the defaults. Um, the wonderful thing about the asset pipeline that we have is that it's very easy to extend. So there's a new config uh, that you can set in application RB or in an initializer um, where you can add paths to the asset pipeline. This path can come from anywhere. When you add it to the asset pipeline, it's accessible from anywhere. So you add Disneyland, and, and there's a goofy image in there. And you can access that from the uh, slash assets pipeline. The slash assets pipeline pulls in everything you have uh, and exposes it from one single place, which is really nice. Here's a concrete example of how I've been using this as I've been converting applications to Rails 3.1. The first thing is a signal ID gem, which is sort of a, a gem that controls all the lock-in logic that we use for the 37 signals applications. Um, that gem itself has a app assets directory, which has a, a JavaScript subdirectory. And in there, we sort of have just like namespaced uh, controllers and models, we have namespaced assets now. Um, inside is a, a file called index.js, which is basically a, uh, what do you call it, manage script for, for this collection of assets. And inside of that, you can say, OK, this gem depends on these three files, identity validation, launch bar, and uh, toggle credentials. The really cool thing is that now we're starting to do basically abstraction. We are hiding things that the app itself shouldn't really know or care about, which is what are the JavaScript files that this plugin depends on. Former to that, you sort of had to manually dump it into that same junk drawer that you saw everything in in the beginning, and thus expose yourself to the internals of uh, the plugin, which is nasty. Now, the way you require this is that you go to to your specific application, go to Basecamp, uh, app assets JavaScript again. Application JS has sort of the same specialness to it as um, application controller or application helper, which means this is where you compile everything that is to be about your application. And we just require signal ID. 
And signal ID will go up and find that signal ID slash index JS and thus in turn require the things again. Okay, well, what is all this good for? All this is good for dependency management. And sort of for a long time, I even poo pooed the idea that Rails should have plugins or that plugins should have dependencies. And before you know it, um, you start using it all over the place. And now, whenever I use an application that, that doesn't have a centralized dependency management system for its, uh, for its libraries, and you have to manually read a readme file or something to figure out all the things you have to install, I'm like, this is nasty. So the wonderful thing is here that we can now use Bundler to manage all our asset dependencies as well. So you can manage all your dependencies on things like JavaScript, images, and style sheets. Sometimes those things will be in packaged um, plugins or engines, like I have the signal ID gem. And sometimes there will be uh, more general purpose things that are just JavaScript or just style sheets, and we'll dive into that in, in a second or two. Cool thing, as I said, there's no copying of assets anymore. I have a bunch of plugins that required some rake task that would copy all these assets over into my own public directory. And then when you update it, you have to remember to sort of run that rake task again. It's just nasty. It's kind of like dumping all of Rails into your Git repository and just checking it all in and just trying to keep it up to date. Uh, no fun at all. So that's what we would do sort of on the application side of things. The wonderful thing about the asset pipeline is we can extend it to everything that has something to do with, with JavaScript's style sheets and images. So for Rails 3.1, we have a new gem, or an updated gem called jQuery Rails gem. jQuery Rails includes a directory, vendor assets JavaScript, that includes the actual jQuery files. So now we've taken those jQuery files, the framework files, We've moved them out of Rails itself, moved them into its own dependency, which can has its own, have its own version number, can be tracked through Bundler on its own accord. And then in the application itself, we can just reference that, which makes it very easy to update and it makes it very easy to bundle these things together. Oh, by the way, jQuery is the new JavaScript framework default in Rails 3.1. Um, that was sort of a, a long time coming, but the wonderful thing about setting it up like this, making it a external dependency, is that all that's required now to switch from jQuery to, say, prototype is this jQuery Rails is a line in your gem file. So it's no longer part of Rails itself. We have a convention set up um, to use these and reference these things, but it's not baked in. Rails, the, the Rails repository no longer includes any JavaScript framework files. So that makes switching back and forth incredibly easy. Um, now, I'm talking a lot about JavaScript because this is where I've been using it mostly. But all of these principles apply equally to CSS. So for example, if you want to include a CSS framework like Blueprint, uh, it works exactly the same way. You can bundle this up in nice external gems, and you can just say, let's depend on it on the side. Awesome. All right. Just what I've shown you right now, the load path alone um, solves that initial problem I had. Now that you have the load path, you don't need this junk drawer of files. Um, and you can split everything out into nice, neat, discrete dependencies. And you can depend on those. Awesome. We could have stopped here. We could have said, just declared victory. We have the load path. Hallelujah. Um, but we're Rails developers. So it's not really enough just to solve the problem. We have to have the pleasure. So um, we introduced this pleasure in sort of a painful way. Um, so the way we introduced, I won't go further down that path. Um, 
discommit. Um, where Josh Peak added CoffeeScript to the default gem file in Rails. He didn't give any justification. He just popped it in there and sat back. <laughs> <laughs> With a big troll face on his, uh, as his avatar. And of course, um, the response was predictable. And this turned into, I think, one of the longest common threads on GitHub. And it had wonderful things like, JavaScript is a toy. It's nothing more than aggregation of features. It's simplistic. It's a hugely newbie thing to do. So lame. This is not a sane default by any stretch of imagination. Just because you guys use it doesn't mean that I want to use it. Thanks, but no thanks. And finally, I smell a fork. <laughs> Which is sort of like the um, Ruby and Rails, perhaps open source equivalent of all reasonable debates always devolve into somebody calling somebody else Hitler. Um, the open source equivalent is, uh, I'm going to fork this thing. Um, so the sort of response from this, uh, from this whole thread was, um, these defaults are really near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, which I can actually I can sympathize with. Um, and, and in some perverted way, I actually sort of appreciate that level of visceral feedback that comes from people. Um, and all of these images sort of came out in, um, in that thread. All right. But one thing is the initial visceral reactions, the knee-jerk reaction that people have when they see something like this without any justification or without any explanation. A and it's, it's good fun. I, I must in say I, I enjoyed that uh, thread. You should look it up on GitHub. I think if you search on uh, Rails CoffeeScript, it's the first hit, and there's about, I don't know, 500 comments there with lots of more funny pictures. Now, OK, fine. We've had that moment. We can step back, breathe. And then we can perhaps listen to some more recent um, arguments for this. So this is a great quote. Uh, CoffeeScript is well done and more convenient to use than JavaScript. And you'd say, all right, I would have written that because I like CoffeeScript, or the guy who made CoffeeScript would have written that. Um, but uh, actually, the guy who wrote that was uh, Brendan Eich, uh, the inventor of JavaScript. Um, so maybe. Sometimes it's just time to chill the fuck out and wait to sort of let this internalize and see where it goes before you, you freak out. He has another wonderful uh, follow-up from that. We should continue to grow the language, keeping support for all forms while adding new forms to help users themselves grow the language. I really respond to quotes like that. Uh, I really like that because, as I talked about at... RubyConf this year, this is exactly why I like Ruby. This is exactly why I'm still using Ruby after eight or nine years. Because Ruby allows us to extend and grow the language while keeping the old forms. That is basically what active support is. And active support is probably my favorite part of Rails. OK. I'm just going to take you quickly through a few sort of snippets of, of what's cool in, in CoffeeScript. Uh, here's actually, uh, I've only been writing this for, for a little while. Here's a piece of code just I'm using in my own application. Uh, and the only thing that this really shows is how little line noise, line noise, line noise this has compared to the um, JavaScript function. So just taking all this out, which is it's kind of ironic because a lot of Ruby people I know are like, what uh, significant white space? That's crazy. That's what the Python guys do. And like, that was never what I had against Python. Like the significant white space, I thought is actually nice. It takes out a lot of things. It makes a few things difficult, solvable things. But that wasn't the beef I had with with Python. Um, and thus, it's not the beef I have with CoffeeScript. I think it's wonderful. So CoffeeScript uses significant white space, and it cuts drastically down on the amount of cruft that you have to use. Particularly because JavaScript has a whole lot more cruft to deal with scoping than, say, Ruby. All right. Um, here's another neat example, um, CoffeeScript. 
uh, doing iteration and calling a method with a callback. Very nice and clean. The equivalent JavaScript version of that, not so nice and clean. Um, here's a few things that, that you can do in, in CoffeeScript that I would actually like to even do in Ruby. Looking at CoffeeScript was the first time I got a little bit of language envy. The first time I was like, damn, why doesn't Ruby do that? Um, is and isn't is a great way of putting it. I thought at first it was a little gimmicky, and then I started using it in my applications, and I thought that was actually pretty cool. So it just makes for really nice readable code. It's a few just drizzles of keywords, and yet um, pretty neat. Um, really neat to, maybe this is the one thing I, 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 I really like, is that uh, in constructors you can sort of, um, there's a shorthand for doing the standard getter and setter. So this class has a constructor that just takes at name, which basically expands into assigning an instance variable called name from the first parameter. Really nice. We do that all the time in Ruby. Wouldn't that be great if we had that in Ruby? All right. Now, I won't go too much into the specifics of CoffeeScript, because there's a whole um, session on that uh, that Trevor is giving tomorrow. Uh, I think at this time, there might actually be a little bit change of, uh, of a schedule. These things were put on top of each other a little bit. But uh, I encourage you to go to, to check that out, and otherwise go to coffeescript.org. It's a fantastic presentation of CoffeeScript, the language. Um, and it has uh, a bunch of these, uh, more of these examples. And the really nice things about CoffeeScript is that uh, it is just JavaScript. It's just like a nicer, cleaner, more well-spoken version of JavaScript. We're still speaking about the same concepts. It's still all boils down to JavaScript. You still constantly compile this into JavaScript to see what's actually going to happen, but it's just a nicer way to get there. Just like uh, Ruby compiles into, or Ruby's written in C and it compiles into something else that's not Ruby directly being run, uh, I think that this is a great step forward for, uh, for JavaScript, basically treating it like it's, it's more kind to, to assembler. Um, okay, so that's the JavaScript side of things. Um, the style sheet side of things is, um, is pretty interesting, too. So it uses the same asset pipeline, which means it has a load path, just like JavaScript has a load path. And it can use preprocessors, just like JavaScript can use a preprocessor. CoffeeScript is just a preprocessor we're putting on top of, um, of JavaScript. And when it's in the load path, it just happens automatically. You will be writing CoffeeScript, and you don't have to do anything. You go straight to your browser, and you reload, and it'll automatically compile it. It'll check if it's new. It'll go through all the motions, and it'll just work. Part of the trouble with this before it was integrated this neatly um, was that you had to do things by hand. There's been a couple of gems that have done sort of some of this stuff, but uh, now we've baked it straight in. Anyway, SAS, or SCSS, is a um, preprocessor for style sheets which basically does the same thing that CoffeeScript does to JavaScript, just as a, at a less expansive scope. And it was originally created by, by this guy, Hampton Gatlin, uh, who I first met in, um, in Canada for the very first Rails conference in, I think, 2005, Canada on Rails. And he presented um, in much the same manner, actually, as he's displayed on this image with a beer in his hand. Um, and he was swearing worse than a sailor, and I thought, I like this guy. <laughs> this is a great guy to have in our community. And I walked away from there thinking, I really should give a, 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 whatever he's talking about a, a chance. Whatever he was talking about, of course, was Hamill, which is uh, uh, Hampton's uh, approach to sort of clean up HTML. Now, I never took on that. Like, I really enjoyed the presentation. I, I never took on and enjoyed uh, Hamill that much, uh, perhaps because I didn't find found the uh, transformation from HTML to, to Hamill to be aesthetically pleasing to me. But I can completely appreciate and understand why, why people would still want to do it. Um, even if it doesn't fancy my aesthetic, it follows the same pattern. So you can say, well, if you like CoffeeScript and you want that compiled into JavaScript, why wouldn't you want something to compile into to HTML? And it's, it's, a very fair, it's a fair point. But um, Hamill, then, to bring it back to SAS, um, was sort of married to, to SAS here. There's sort of this uh, 
loft connection going on, which meant for a very long time I didn't care about SAS either, because I'd sort of written off Haml as something that didn't apply to my sense of aesthetics. Um, and and thus, since these two things were, were bound together, it wasn't something I could use for a whole lot. Well, here's a Ryan Singer putting it, uh, sort of how I felt it. Like, requiring Haml to use SAS feels like inviting somebody you don't like over to your house because they have a cute friend. Um, of course, Hamel, which I, I, one of the reasons I appreciate it still is sort of uh, the fan base is as rapid as anything. So Ryan actually had to go out and uh, afterwards almost apologize for making a joke about it. I hope the Hamel topic didn't overshadow the important points of my talk. Thanks for the feedback so far. Um, I think he brought this up at, uh, at a conference and spent half his talk defending why he just said what he just said. So uh, anyway, back to SAS. So SAS basically drips just a few things on top of CSS to make it more like uh, programming, to take some of those repetitive things out that we keep doing over and over again and, and replace them with programming. Uh, the thing I've actually seen used the most and the one feature that I appreciate the most from this is just nesting, which is just about indention and not repeating yourself over and over again. It also has variables and has a bunch of other features. Uh, I don't think that transformation is as dramatic as it is going from JavaScript to CoffeeScript. That feels like, whoa, this was big. I now enjoy it so much more. This is more like, nice, awesome. We can do this too. This is great. Why would I, run why would I want to write regular uh, CSS again now that I know this? And as luck have it, we have a uh, guy who's been working on a uh, SAS project, Chris Epstein, uh, giving another talk, which was originally planned on top of the CoffeeScript talk, but I think we're trying to work out how to move those things around. So you can go to Seatball. Thanks. OK. Um, but of course, we will always want to take this one step further. So this is not just about making it possible. This is also about making it easy and making it something that people will actually use. Thus, we have baked it straight into the generators. The default assumption will be that if you change nothing, you will want to want write CoffeeScript and SAS instead of JavaScript and CSS. So generators like the um, resource generator will now generate stop files for you. Uh, when you generate a new post resource, you get the controller, you get the model, and you're now also going to get a stop file for uh, the JavaScript that goes with it and the style sheet that goes with it, which sort of ties it into that whole um, sphere we have where you also automatically get a helper, you also automatically get testing, you get all the things that's reasonable for somebody to want to use when they're creating a new resource, which means that we're elevating all of this stuff up to the same level of importance as the Ruby code itself. It even lives in app now. It doesn't live in, in public anymore. Public is just a deploy target, and uh, soon enough, it'll just be empty, uh, and there'll be nothing to it. Uh, another neat little uh, side note is that um, the pre-processing pipeline for this uses something called Tilt, which is kind of like rack for template handlers. Uh, we're going to integrate that into Rails more shortly. But in the meanwhile, we're just using it for the asset pipeline. It has this cool feature that you can keep appending um, preprocessors. So you can apply SAS to style sheets, and then you can also apply ERB on top of the SAS, which allows you to do things like this, to reference helpers straight inside the JavaScript, which is really neat. Um, because it allows you to reference, for example, other assets um, that you want to use straight in there. Awesome. All right. So SAS, CoffeeScript, defaults. Well, there are other ways to achieve these things. Uh, there are competitors or alternatives or whatever you want to call it to something like SAS. Less is one example. We've made it really easy to integrate that stuff too. So if, if you want to use less instead of SAS, it'll be almost trivial to do. Um, but that sort of debate 
uh, brought up an older debate that we've been having for a long time. I just want to settle it once and for all. Now, on the one hand, we have the idea or the notion that, that Rails should have defaults, that we will pick things, we will pick choices where there are alternatives, and then there's sort of the other argument that Rails should have no defaults, and we should instead leave it to the programmer to figure out what's best in his particular or her particular situation, and um, they'll sort of string it all together as, as, as they please. Now, defaults one. It's over. Rails will have opinions about things, and it will pick winners for its default stack that we will promote. It's a settled score. It's not going to change. Um, so sort of something I, I've, I, I keep thinking about whenever this topic comes up is, uh, is, is the first time I ordered a uh, burger when I came to the US about 10 years ago. Um, and it looked something like this. And when I got that plate delivered, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why didn't they finish it? <laughs> like, presumably, there's a chef out there who's preparing the food, but it comes out disassembled. <laughs> Why do I have to get a construction kit to just get a meal? Like, I asked for a burger. Presumably, there's somebody back there cooking and preparing it who knows something about pu putting a burger together, yet I have to get this shit, and I have to put it together myself, and I'll get all greasy, and it's nasty. This is not a civilized way to eat. <laughs> when you order a burger in Copenhagen, you get a knife and a fork and a prepared meal. <laughs> and I was like, why can't it just be like that? So I swore that uh, Rails was not going to be construction kit food. We were going to have a chef in the back kitchen who would present you with a finished dish that you can enjoy straight away without thinking, ooh, how much lettuce am I going to put on here? Um, uninteresting choices. Like, the lettuce is the lettuce. And whether you have one or two tomatoes doesn't matter as long as you sort of don't have to get all greasy. So um, this sort of adds another corollary, which is the idea of uh, the curated framework, which is that, that we will pick things that, since the beginning of time, we presented as what most people would want to do most of the time. I firmly believe that most people, most of the time, will want to use CopyScript and SAS. So it makes for great defaults. And people who are not interested in going into the intricate details of whether I should have one or two slices of tomato can just start enjoying the framework right away. And for people who are interested in doing that, it's still possible. It's a little messy. You have to sort of take the tomato out afterwards, but, but you can do it. So this is what we start with in the default gem file, um, something we sort of called soft dependencies. So in Ruby gems, there are hard dependencies. If you name another gem in your Ruby spec, that gem is forcefully installed when you install the parent gem. Not an option. You can't choose not to have it. So we wanted to step that back just one step. And which means that we're going to include these in the default gem file instead. And the gem file, of course, is uh, available for anybody to edit. And all they have to do is this. And there will be no SAS, and there will be no coffee script. And by default, the generators will not generate .coffee or .sass. So this is all it takes. Um, pretty easy to do, but still worth flipping out over for just one day. Um, Now, this is sort of a long process. And, and I, I remember hearing a lot of people fearing, like, well, if you're adding all these preprocessors and you have the load path and everything, how will it scale? Well, um, this is not just some hippie love thing. This actually is, is sort of carefully thought out. And the way we thought it out was uh, pre-compilation. So by default, we've added a new rake task that you will pop into your Capistrano script or whatever else you're using to deploy. Uh, it's called rake assets precompile. It'll go through your entire load path. Um, and by default, it'll precompile application JS and application CSS, which will include all the JavaScript that you've set 
it should include in all the CSS. And it'll copy over all the images too, such that these are all just um, static hits. The way it copies them over, though, is pretty interesting and, and a big step up from what we have today. So what we have today is Rails, by default, uses m time to figure out whether this is a new asset or not. And it sort of just appends that to the, to the parameters. Now, m time is, is fine if you never deploy your app. If you deploy your app, you're going to change your m times, and you're going to ask your users to request the same uh, styles and uh, JavaScripts again, even though you didn't change them. Not very nice. So we moved instead to, to using, uh, I think, just MD5 for hashing these asset files and then appending the hash to the file name itself, um, which is then referenced. So static file, uh, no longer params, all wonderful. And the way you just include it is just say JavaScript include tag application, and it will automatically figure out, oh, there's an application file. It has a um, uh, MD5 stamp on its file name, and it'll just work. The great thing about that, as I just said, it's file-based. It's not params-based, which means it's stable. It also means um, you can keep it around from deploy to deploy. So one of the problems some apps have is if they deploy a new version that changes things in the JavaScript or the style sheets, there's sort of a mid-flight moment where somebody might be halfway through a request, and they're requesting uh, what the application needs is the old version of the style sheets or the JavaScripts, and what it's getting is the new versions. Since you can keep both versions side by side, it'll just work, which is really nice. It also passes much better through proxies uh, and caching schemes. There's a lot of caching schemes that do not work well with the uh, parameter-based way of doing exploration. It just works when it's just a part of the file. Line. Really nice. Uh, to top that off, um, we have compressors built straight in. So for JavaScript, we compress with something called Uglyfire. We're still sort of going through the last moments of making that work. But it'll strip out all the comments. It'll sort of concatenate and make it small and make it easy just to the next step is gzipping, which you can do on your web server. And then it's going to be really nice, neat, and, and tight. And the same thing we do with uh, CSS, which means that there's no penalty to writing nice, beautiful code. There's no penalty to having um, comments or anything else in there. We'll just automatically strip that out. Now, all this is based on t something called sprockets, which um, Sam Stevenson and Josh Peake have been working on for, for quite some time. This is the underpinning, the underlying engine that makes all this work. So I just want to say great job to Sam. And, and Josh, thank you. Um, all right. Now I can sort of almost see the mouth water drizzling down uh, your chin. And you're like, when can I get my hands on this amazing technology? I have a junk drawer. I treat CSS and JavaScript like second class citizens. Will this happen before the world ends? Yes. We're releasing the release candidates for 3.1 this week at this conference. <laughs> um, all right, so that's the asset pipeline. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I've been building a couple of apps with it, and um, I would not want to go back. Now. The second part of that is sort of a larger question. Where is all this going? Where is this taking us? Um, we're making it easier to do more JavaScript. We're making it more pleasurable to write JavaScript, which means that most people would want to write more of it and have more of it in their applications. Um, but at the same time, we have all these other things coming up on the side that sort of um, are adjusting for our attention. So. One of those things is, is the idea of the complete split. So we launched something called Basecamp Mobile a couple of months ago um, that uses uh, a Rails backend, but uses the Rails backend as though it was just an API. There's nothing else to it. It doesn't do any views or anything else like that. And then on the front end, everything was made entirely in JavaScript. Yes, it was made with CoffeeScript, and it was made with uh, Eco and, and a few other frameworks, and, and that was all nice. Um, 
we sort of announced that at 37 signals as a Cinco, and then we sort of didn't talk about it again. Um, and, and not because we don't want to push it out there. I, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, I love that we did the, uh, the Basecamp mobile apps in it. It gave us access to all of the mobile platforms, which is uh, it's surprising to me that we somehow have to relearn that it's nice to write platform-independent code. Um, but we do, because iOS, is, iOS apps are sexy, and, and we all want sexy until we realize that customers always also want it on Android, and there's a Windows phone, and there's other phones, and then before you know it, sexy is kind of a nightmare, and you have to maintain a bunch of different versions. All right, some people still want to do that. God bless them. Uh, I want to write things for the web. That's what I care about. I do not care about being inside somebody else's walled garden. I love the web, and I love the fact that uh, these phones are now getting good enough that using HTML5 is a, is a great way forward. So our alternative to writing a native app was to write it using Cingo and getting something that's very close to the speed of a native app, but using HTML5, using JavaScript, and so forth. Now, Cingo splits these things up. So there's a, there's a front end that's all JavaScript. It has its own little MVC bu uh, bubble where you make models that are backed by the API backend. You have controllers to sort of route things around, and you have the view. Everything is, is nightly, nicely written in JavaScript. And then on the back end, you have Rails, which has its own MVC on top, too, and just serves as an API. And then um, you're sort of writing a distributed app, right? You're, you're writing these things with separate things. And, and I, as I got more into it, and, and as I saw the speed of development, that, that the results from that was like, I don't know. Like, I like this because, I mean, we're still using Rails. That's great for the back end, so we can have all our domain logic in there. But then we're using all this stuff on the front end that's um, actually pretty heavy. And it's a tall stack to keep in mind. You basically have MVC times two that you have to keep in your head at, at one time. Um, that's a pretty hard and pretty tall mental stack. And what I fear is that we'll go back to the time I just tried to pull us away from, which was the split, when there is a guy who works on the front end, and then there's a guy that works on the back end, and they sort of only talk to each other by throwing shit over the wall. Uh, that's not really a very nice future. Anyway, it can certainly be done. We, we did it for the Basecamp Mobile. I really like the output of it. But I feared that maybe this is not that future I was hoping it would be. It seems too hard. Um, all right. Well, so that's one alternative, right? That's, that's one way we can go. And, and um, that does work. I don't think necessarily it's the right way to go for everything. But uh, another alternative is to, to use something like Node.js. So Node.js basically is, is using JavaScript on the server side. It has some really interesting uh, ideas that makes it easy to write fast, socket-like stuff. Um, and it's all JavaScript all the time, which is, which is pretty neat, right? I have a natural inclination to like that sort of modernist approach. We will just come up with one theme, one paradigm, and we will apply it to everything. I think programmers in general really like that. They like that modernist approach from sort of uh, an instinctual level. There's just an instinctual attraction to that one thing all the time. This is just one uh, split. Even the Cinco stuff has that, where there's a sort of a very strict wall. Rails is just responsible for the API. Uh, Cinco on the front end is just responsible for the JavaScript. And we have clear separation and no bleeding, no drawing across the lines. Now, sort of the instinctual reaction that I had to this was uh, awesome, is then replaced afterwards with this nagging feeling that, hmm, all right, this is nice, this is modern, but um, I, I, I don't really like the workflow. I don't really like what comes of it. Of the few things I've looked at, the code I've looked for, say, something like Node.js, it, it, I like the simplicity when I'm just looking at one screen of code. I don't like the simplicity when I'm looking at five or 10 screens of code. Like, it loses that to me, which is the same thing I have, the affection I have for something like Sinatra. I love Sinatra for something that's clean and can fit on one, two, three screens of scroll. I really don't like it when it goes beyond that. 
because it sort of goes back to me, it feels a lot like that garbage bag style coding. Everything just in one thing, which works when it's very neat and clear and there's just a few things, less than 13, you have to keep in your head. Wonderful. Doesn't work so well when it goes beyond that to me. Now, as I was thinking through this, I was thinking uh, of, uh, of one particular guy who's been talking about this for quite some time. Uh, Larry Wall had this wonderful uh, talk back in 1999 about uh, Perl as a postmodern programming language. And here's a wonderful quote. A modernist has to decide whether this is true or that is true. The modernist believes in or more than and. Postmodernists believe in and more than or. And I really I encourage you guys to, to after this talk, Google uh, postmodern Larry Wall, and you'll find the whole speech, and it's, it's wonderful. Because this explains exactly um, the divide. I want Rails to be a postmodern framework. I want Rails to take a little bit here, a little bit there, not have a single driving idea, uh, not have a all JavaScript all the time, that's the, the main model idea as, as driving everything. And I think that we can apply this to how we build web applications, even in this um, world where things have to be snappier and they have to be faster, and there are people doing native apps, and there are people doing things just in JavaScript, and that's, that's all great. Now, a sl short presentation here of, of how that postmodern relationship could work and how I've been working on it for any new apps that I work on. So here's just a sample screen from, from Basecamp. And you see it has a lot of elements. Some of these elements are more interactive than others. There's a project settings link that's just a vanilla HTML link. It doesn't do anything special. It's very easy for us now at this point to write a new HTML screen. There's no mechanics involved. There's no replacement. There's no fanciness, which is fine for things that happens very rarely. The project settings screen is not something you go to very often. I have not bothered to make that Ajaxified or anything else to make it faster, because who cares when people only see it once a month, if that. Now, the second part is things you use slightly more frequent than that. The tabs, for example, you want to jump between different sections in your app, and you don't want to wait for a whole page reload for that to happen, because that feels too slow. Um, we have something I'll talk to you about in a second called PJAX which is a wonderful approach to, to, to dealing with that and making that fast. So that brings it up just one level. All right, it's not just straight HTML, so it's faster than that. It's still using replacement, though, so it's, it's not ultimately fast. If you take something like the to-do list, for example, you want to drag things up and down, you want to check them off, that needs to be highly interactive. It needs to be very fast. And the faster you can make that, the better. People are going to use that all the time. There might be 20 clicks on this little area um, when a person is on this page. If you can take just that part and say, all right, we'll go full board on it. Um, we'll go Backbone and Echo and all of these other wonderful JavaScript technologies where you sort of have almost small little bit widgets, um, that'd be great. Now, the cool thing when I look at this page is that the amount of effort that goes into creating the full, highly interactive approach of uh, something Backbone Echo, which is basically what we were using for Basecamp Mobile. We can localize that to just the spot that requires it. And then we can use sort of a degrading, um, degrading, that's not the word I was looking for. We can use sort of like a, a, a scale uh, of other techniques when you, we don't need that level of interactivity. Um, here's a, a quick video showing um, PJAX. So as you can see, right now I'm just clicking around links. Um, and they reload, and the whole page reloads. I'll actually show you that again. It goes a little fast. So look at that. Look at the address bar. This thing is reloading. All right, it takes a little while. It's replacing these things with full page reload. That would be the project settings things. PJAX, turn that on. Now things are much faster. You're replacing things in line. It still works with the full address bar. Um, I've been using this in a new app. and. Uh, for the sections of the app we were using this on, you could not tell the difference in speed between something just using PJAX and something using a full Cinco style development form. It is really fast. The way it works is that it basically treats the layout as being stable. 
which means that the application uh, uh, JS and CSS are kept stable. They're not re-requested. You're just replacing the inner part of, of the app. So if you see something like um, Basecamp, like all the red stuff would just stay stable. You're only replacing the stuff in the middle. When you do that, it's actually really, really fast. And most importantly, on the server side, you can have this as um, no change. The only thing you're not doing when you're doing PJAX is rendering the layout over and over again, which means that each of the individual pages will still work when you go directly to them, because you're still serving them with a the layout. And when you go to them through PJAX, the only thing you're not doing is serving them the layout, which can be ex completely abstracted away. Um, so you don't even care about it in your regular development flow. I think this is absolutely awesome. Uh, this is Chris from, from GitHub that, uh, that made this thing. And uh, I'd be very surprised if, if PJAX is not a, a standard part of the, the Rails stack from the next version on. Uh, I'm already using it uh, on, on all of my new stuff. And I highly encourage you guys to look into it. Um, and what's really nice about it is it uses HTML5, uh, I forget what it's called, like location storage or something else like that, um, where you can manipulate the address bar without doing nasty stuff like the hash bank that you see in a lot of uh, dynamic apps these days. Uh, I really don't like the aesthetics of the hash bank. I understand why it's there, but now we have something much ba better in, in HTML5, and it's supported in Firefox 4, uh, latest Safari, uh, latest Chrome, and I don't know if it's supported in IE yet. But the wonderful thing about it is that it has an obvious uh, dropback. If it's not supported, all they get is full page changes. And you have to change nothing in your app to make that happen. Really nice. All right. Um, finally, the, the fast version, the one where we want the high interactivity on the app itself, um, Backbone is really a great way of, of getting there. It's made by the same guy, uh, Jeremy, that made uh, CoffeeScript. We used it for Basecamp Mobile. And it basically allows you to encapsulate just that one piece of functionality into a full MVC model, which uh, means you're just transporting JSON back and forth really fast, really nice. Combine that with uh, something like um, Eco, which is CoffeeScript template language like ERB. It looks a lot like ERB, but this is actually CoffeeScript. Um, and you can use those templates with your backbone models, and, and it feels a lot like uh, what you've already been doing. And then finally, I think that this pattern is still completely applicable and awesome. This pattern is basically what we've had for a long time, which is you have a form on the client side. Uh, it's set up with remote true, which means it's going to do an AJAX request. That hits a controller, and then the controller will actually do the JavaScript update. Now, this model does not fit into the modernist approach of just one thing um, or one approach for everything all the time. This generates the, the view or the response on the server side, um, which to some people comes across as being not right because the generation of all this stuff should just happen on the, the JavaScript side. And I've seen some, in my mind, little silly things where people are rendering templates as JSON uh, in JSON wrappers just to send them down the wire just so they can replace them from in there, which doesn't make any sense to me at all. Because the wonderful thing about this is that we can reuse everything. So when you're rendering your responses here, you can just re-render the same templates you would do as when you were rendering the first thing in the first place. All right. That is the asset pipeline and our postmodern hybrid JavaScript future. Thank you. <laughs>